it's four o'clock. Um, so I suppose we should get started. My name is Joe Tillotson. I'm a conservation technician with Ramsey County Soil and Water. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming by today for this knotweed we're putting, or this webinar we're putting on for some knotweed. Um, right now, I'm sharing the screen. This is the uh, kind of the agenda for the next hour and a half. Uh, maybe we'll take a few more minutes to just let some more people file in. But after that, going to be having quite a few guest speakers this afternoon. First, we'll have Lori Seal, who's a SISMA coordinator in Duluth, and she'll present on how to identify knotweed and some of the things that she has been working on out there. And after Lori, we'll be hearing from uh, Professor Roger Becker, who's got a lot of great research on herbicide, and I know he's brought with him some colleagues as well that are all very excited to share some of their research. And I'll also be touching on some non-chemical treatment methods for knotweed through smothering. And after that, a couple of weeks ago, um, myself, Justin Townsend, and a few others had a meeting and roundtable discussion with some of our new friends from the United Kingdom went very well, uh, went for almost two hours. So it was a really good time and we got a lot to discuss and share with you as that was recorded. So we're gonna have a recording of that and some clips from that discussion to share. The full discussion um, from two weeks ago with those people from the United Kingdom will be made available um, in full for everyone to see. Uh, at a later time, and this webinar is also being recorded as well. So this will be available to be viewed later, additionally. And after all that, we'll have some more dedicated time for questions and answers. If you have any questions at all about what you saw here today, or if you have a specific question for a specific person, that would be definitely the time. But if you have any really burning questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. And that's gonna be monitored. And we will be able to answer some of those questions. It looks like. Sorry, one of the guest speakers that's planned for later is having a little bit of trouble getting in, but I see Lori is here. Uh, Lori, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit and talking about what you're, you've been up to? Yes, hello. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph, um, or Joe, I guess you go by. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to see this. Um, 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 event happen, I guess, and more opportunities to work on our knotweed control in Minnesota. So thanks for getting everybody um, moving forward together on this. Um, uh, yeah, and my, my name is Lori Seeley, as Joe mentioned, and I coordinate our Duluth Area Collaborative Invasive Species Management Area. Don't let the name throw you off. Um, it's, it's wider. Um, we're a little bit bigger than Duluth. We're in South St. Louis County in Minnesota. So um, we have about roughly 21 partners that are actively participating in our collaborative. So um, I'm excited to share with you today a little bit about identification. And if we have time, I'll talk about other things we have done. So uh, Joe, is it okay if I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, absolutely. Do you need permission to do that or is it going to let you go ahead? I think it's allowing me to do so. Can you see yep. it? Yeah, okay. that's, it's working. Cool. And I think I need to get in the presenter mode. Um, I'm trying to remember here. Give me a second. Oh, there we go. All right. How does that look? You can see it fine? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. 
Um, at the end of my slides too, I, I will have my contact information if you need to um, email me or whatnot for questions. Um, so again, I run the collaborative in South St. Louis County in Northern Minnesota, and um, we've been going for about five years, so it's pretty exciting. Um, so general knotweed uh, identification. Before, anytime I'm presenting to the public or vegetation managers, uh, so local government, right-of-way managers, et cetera, um, I remind people that you don't have to be a botany expert. You just need to know some basic things. And I think knotweed is pretty, uh, pretty easy for most people to identify. In our community, a lot of people call it bamboo. But here's some general traits to look for. Um, Oops, uh, the stems in the winter are like a burnt orange. Um, that's how you, you'd find them now. Um, the knotweed, typically much of it is it has some height to it. You can see um, one of our technicians right now um, in, in the patch of knotweed there standing next to it. Shoots in the spring. Um, some people like to compare to asparagus coming up, whatever works for you. But um, these are things, uh, this, the spring shoots to look for. And then also that you'll notice that the stem of the bamboo has these nodes as well, or the um, knotweed rather. So some general traits to look for. Um, other things that we mentioned to the public when we're teaching about knotweed is we look for kind of a lacy flower. So uh, you can see the sprays of the knotweed flowers here. Um, and then you can also see the roots too. And those roots, um, you won't be necessarily going to each plant to identify and dig up a root. But what is really important, I think, about um, the root system, they can grow up to around 60 feet long and six feet deep. So that's just really important in thinking about when we're going to be talking about later in the presentation control and different methods, just thinking about that dynamic root system it has. Um, and I like to. The, the, kid, the school kids especially like this. Um, they, they like the analogy of the iceberg. So there's um, a whole mount below the ground that we cannot see that's going around um, along with this, this root system in the rhizomes. So um, some things to think about, again, for management purposes. Uh, it doesn't mean that all knotweed stems and all knotweed plants are doing this, but um, just good to keep in mind that it is a robust system to allow for, to help for over, over wintering. Um, okay, uh, some general traits for knotweed. Um, again, so we have different shapes of leaves a bit. Um, the giant knotweed is the largest one and you can see my hand on there for reference point. Um, the largest of the knotweeds here in, in um, North, Northern Minnesota, we have Bohemian, of course, we have um, Japanese knotweed, and then we have one that is a, a compacta, or uh, there's so many different names for it, but it's just a smaller one um, that is planted around Duluth in various areas. So those are three different leaves. I pulled up this picture too. Um, it's out of a, the key to invasive knotweeds in British Columbia. It's a, it's a good guide on knotweeds. Um, and anyway, I, why I circled this is I just wanted you to take a peek at the variation in the bohemian leaves. Um, they can be different size, um, size of leaves to, to notice. So just pulled that up for reference quickly. And leaves alone are not a good indicator um, for, for identification of it. But I'm gonna remind you, um, the good part is, I think I like to tell people don't get overwhelmed and knowing what species I have and all these types of things, it's really just important to know that it's a knotweed plant um, and, and the properties an invasive knotweed plant um, and, and what it has. So uh, another trait that the, the guide um, or the key rather has is they suggest that the hairs on the back of the leaves may help for identification. Uh, to be frank about it, I haven't used this as much um, and most of our most people, most of our citizens up here and residents, they haven't used that as much either um, because genetics get sticky and some of these plants can get harder to identify. So, but that is something you could explore if you wanted to look into that further. Um, I didn't wanna miss that. I know we have some really good citizen scientists and um, 
other professionals on here that might find that interesting as well. So um, let's see. Japanese knotweed is definitely common in northern Minnesota. Um, and that one is roughly five to 10 feet. This shape of this leaf too, uh, some people like to use the analogy and thinking about it um, as, a, as a shovel. If you were to go out and um, dig in the ground a round point shovel, they think of, of that, that's kind of a helpful um, guide for them. Uh, the leaves also uh, are alternating as well. Um, so that's another thing that means they're coming off on different sides of the branch here. So, and I'm not gonna get too far down the rabbit hole of all the genetics and things, um, but uh, yeah, Jap Japanese knotweed has uh, female flowers and males occurring on, on separate plants and things. So I, again, I'm not gonna get into some of those genetics. I'll leave that to um, uh, Professor Becker there. So um, Bohemian knotweed is another uh, species we found in northern Minnesota. They have it quite a bit in Wisconsin too. Uh, and it's roughly six feet, six feet tall to 15 feet tall. And going back to Japanese knotweed, Japanese knotweed, the, the stands are a little bit shorter often, but again, these are generalizations and, um, you know, there is some variation. The, the other thing about Bohemian knotweed is that it, depending on the plant you have, it could have, um, it could be, it's a mix of both the giants, so the largest knotweed, as well as Japanese uh, as well. So it could be displaying, depending on which um, plant, uh, which genetics are displaying uh, stronger. It could be, you know, the leaves might be more like this, or you might get some, um, Bohemian knotweed that the leaves are really large on. And then because it's displaying more of the giant uh, um, genetics that it is carrying versus the other ones. It depends on which ones are displaying. And again, I'm, I'm just giving you a very general expl explanation of this. So, um, so, and here is giant knotweed. You can see, this is a picture I took uh, when I was visiting um, Northern Wisconsin because they have they have giant knotweed and they, they have similar problems. So uh, one of the things I did as a coordinator, it was really important for me to reach out to other collaboratives to see in other communities to see how they were dealing with their um, knotweed. And just because we haven't found any known cases of giant knotweed in Northern Minnesota, um, it, it's important for me to still uh, inform our community about it because it could be here and we haven't mapped it yet or uh, potentially, um, uh, you know, it could spread, it, it could spread uh, via the states too. That was another concern about really staying connected with, I guess, the Wisconsin coordinator in this photo too. Another thing in this picture that's interesting, you'll see it right in the right of way as well. So that's uh, another thing we've been addressing in both the Northern Minnesota community, as well as the Wisconsin community, uh, really working with local governments and their staff. So, um, and again, this, this leaf is quite large and it's very obvious that it's not giant. And <laughs> at least to me, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's not um, uh, Bohemian knotweed uh, or Japanese. However, again, like some, some of the identification of this uh, fooled some of the people in our community that are really um, uh, botanical experts because we, it would take a genetic testing to determine whether, which species you have essentially. So, um, and uh, one last thing I wanted to mention, yeah, the flowers too, it's, the timing in the northern part of the state is usually around August sometimes. So that's when we're preparing for our treatments. Okay, and then another common species um, is false bamboo. Uh, it goes by a few different names. I do have the scientific name at the top, as you'll know too. Um, but this plant was has appeared to be intentionally planted um, uh, in various parts of the city. And you could say that about some of the other um, uh, types of 
stamp or the other types of knotweed as well. But this one specifically was found in planters like along this business here, um, which I have to tell you, it actually has been treated and for the last five years, we have not seen it. So fingers crossed, um, we are gonna be seeing more results of our treatments and all of our efforts in time as we go along. But, um, and then some of the other spots around the city too, by the lake walk, if you've ever been down there, it's like, it was definitely landscaped in. So um, this is another one. Um, and you can look for uh, what you wanna be looking for in this one. You can definitely see that the leaf shape um, and size of it is much smaller. Um, and it, it displays uh, pink, more of a pink and white flower, which is kind of unique as well. And the height is quite a bit shorter, around three feet. So, okay. The last thing I wanted to mention, because there are some questions um, too, is that we get a lot of questions about other types of knotweed that we don't have here too. Um, but it's just something that you'll see if you go to Home Depot and you wanna buy you know, um, a, a bamboo, there, there's different types of plants. And, and um, obviously like they're not, they're, they're probably invasive someplace in the US. And a lot of them, I guess that's the other thing to mention, you know, as a perennial, um, they do they do tend to um, go dormant over the winter, but then right in the spring again, they, they start coming up. So, um, all right. So I wanted to bring up uh, this, this uh, native one, and there's also an invasive one that's smaller that we get a lot of questions on. And why I bring this to your attention, because you'll find it in disturbed sites. Maybe a house was built there. Maybe it was a gravel pit. And it, there's different types of um, knotweeds uh, that are qu quite viney. Um, and although they're in the same family, um, they don't, from my knowledge at least, they don't cause the same issues as the invasive knotweeds. So these other invasive knotweeds. So they, they are quite aggressive though too. And again, I'm not gonna go into that too much, but um, same family, but different, uh, <laughs> some different traits, different characteristics going on here. So um, this slide here, you'll see that uh, we get some questions coming in from the community about, well, I saw this plant here. Do you know what this is? And people will see wild cucumber flowers and the flowers of wild cucumber um, can make people think of knotweed sometimes, especially if you're zipping along at the highway, on the highway or, or down a street. Um, so anyway, wild cucumber flowers, your brain might think of this stuff. Red osier dogwood, um, if you know what that one is. Uh, the stems, again, in winter, you know, if you're zipping along pretty fast or you're on your bike or whatever, you might, you might see something like this and it, you might be, oh my gosh, that's knotweed. But um, again, potential lookalikes. Raspberry stems, that's another one. Um, but again, these red osier dogwood, raspberry stems, they're not a hollow stem. They, you know, go back to that list again. They don't have those nodes. There's, there's different things um, happening with uh, these uh, aspen leaves, uh, aspen saplings, and American basswood leaves too. Um, in boulevard plantings, I know one or two of us, when we were out mapping um, quite a few times, we would be going by on a bike or in a car and we're like, oh my gosh, there's another patch. And really it wasn't, it wasn't another patch. It was just uh, when we got out and investigated further, it was, it was, um, you know, basswood leaves or aspen saplings or something like that. Um, but uh, there were times when our radar was correct and it was indeed a small, tiny knotweed patch too. So <laughs> you can imagine that some of us were having um, a few nightmares about knotweed being everywhere. <laughs> so, um, all right, that's, that's uh, basically sums up the knotweed identification. I, I did it pretty quick and simple, um, but uh, Joe did ask me to share a little bit about um, what, what we did, how we approached it here in the, the uh, collaborative, in our collaborative up here. And I can tell you, you know, it takes a lot of community working across um, property lines. That's the goal of a collaborative invasive species management area, to work across the legal property lines, to help educate not only the landowners, but also the agency staff uh, for local government and elsewhere. That That's really 
the approach we've taken. And what has really helped us there is um, uh, the Department of Agriculture and the U of M had already done some pretty great work up here. The city of Duluth had done some mapping and things too, but being tied into specifically the science community and, and, um, and uh, the Department of Agriculture and working with them has really elevated our efforts because we need all those, those people to help us, to help inform us. So we're, we're making science-based decisions rather than just going off of preconceived notions on this stuff. So I think that's a big point. Um, I think another big point is that uh, through the stewardship network um, who I am employed by, I really reached out to a lot of um, other communities in Michigan, uh, the state of Michigan, um, Wisconsin, elsewhere to see how they've been dealing with their knotweed. So I really networked with them because I said, you, you've already been doing this for years. What is working for you? How have you educated your community? How have you, um, you know, bridged? How have you looked for funding? How have you helped, you know, um, the local government uh, do not we control all these aspects. So, so that networking was really huge because they did share a lot of lessons with us. So, um, and here's just a quick map for you of a bunch of the knotweed that we have mapped um, over 300 sites. Um, we are guessing it's spread from improper cutting, dump sites and disposal spread, slope and stream corridors. Um, as you know, Duluth is on a hill, so. <laughs> um, and we got a lot of answers. It's pretty, I got some from my neighbor. So um, there's a lot of that going on too. So that's all part of the work we are um, tackling up here. And there's, there's some mystery too of why there's so much, like were the nurseries selling it or um, you know, how, how did we get so much right up here? Um, and I threw this slide in there about landowner responsibility because that's another thing with our, we do public um, knotweed workshops and we recorded it online just like Joe's working, you know, has done here too. And um, each year we have had a public knotweed workshop. We've had over 50 attendees. We've also done knotweed workshops for our contractors, local contractors that would potentially be managing knotweed. Um, we've also done little, little mini sessions for um, the county staff that are out maintaining our right of ways, um, the city staff that are also doing the same thing. So a lot of that is happening too. So these are some steps I just threw up there as well that we really uh, encourage landowners to do. Do your research, make a plan, perform control, and then ongoing monitoring and maintenance. And the cool part is, and really great part is, is we've been working with local governments. We've said, hey, you know, the, the city is really working on managing their part. They're, they're tackling, um, they're, they're managing these, these sites here for invasive species. Can you do the part on your land too? Because you're also um, part of this equation as well. So. Um, and then let's see, I don't know, here's some resources I guess I thought you might find interesting. Um, we've definitely used uh, the literature from the Department of Agriculture. They've been wonderful um, partners. Uh, we also created our own knotweed brochure and knotweed door hanger. I actually have one of our door hangers right here. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but. Anyway, that was really useful in inviting people to our knotweed workshop. And we attended a, a little flyer on it too, and we left it on their doorknob. And we had targeted like hot zones and priorities where we wanted to specifically invite people to our workshop. Then we also had a knotweed public service announcement go on TV. We've done tons of articles. We have also our Google partner site as well. And that has knotweed resources for landowners and, and all on there too. So we, we've been busy up here, but it's definitely taken a lot of people. And I will say a big thing, and, and many of you know this from living through COVID as we are a pandemic, we really, um, we have a messaging subcommittee in our collaborative and we really push consistent messaging from day one. 
so that's really been helpful too, I think. So um, I hope I didn't go over too much, Joe, but um, that's what I got for you. And uh, feel free to ask questions or um, I can hold off as well. So thank you. Well, thank you, Lori. That was really great. I really appreciate you taking the time to come out and, and do this. Uh, if you have any questions for Lori, please put them in the chat. Uh, we do have to keep things moving along though. Um, but again, I promise there will be time for open questions at the end. But with all that said, uh, Roger, are you here? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. How are you doing today? Let me try to share my screen, if that works. Do you want us to target 25 or cut it a little shorter? Uh, you can still go for your 25. That'll be okay. okay. And we'll see if we can get this thing to work. Okay, it went blank. Let's try that. I'll just try to beam it in again. Apologize. Okay, now do you see something? Yep, it's all working. Um, <laughs> okay. Looks Sorry. good. Uh, no worries. If uh, you wouldn't mind introducing yourself just for yep. those who don't know, that'd be great. Sorry, we've been having computer challenges. I'm Roger Becker. I'm a weed scientist at the University of Minnesota, and I dabble in all sorts of things. And I'm old enough that I grew up in the academic world in the 70s when herbicides were a big deal. So part of one thing I do do is still play with herbicides. And one of the things is a lot of work's been done by various people and the, the boots on the ground folks that are on this uh, webinar and maybe watching have a lot of experience and maybe know a lot of good answers already. My thought was I haven't seen a, a exhaustive screen of the possibilities of herbicides. Um, so we, we were just gonna sit back go through the chemistries and see if something might be there that could offer some other opportunities for weed control. Uh, I also caught some really nasty crud this weekend, so um, my voice is faltering. <laughs> so, but we'll see if we can get through this. Dallas Drazen is a student with uh, Alan uh, Smith and Neil Anderson doing excellent work on genetics, which is relevant to what we think about when it comes time to control them as well. So we're gonna share a little screen time with Dallas. We kind of just said this, I guess, but not weed control, as you all know, is it can be difficult. It can be very costly. And an entrenched population, generally, it's going to take follow-up treatments no matter what you do. And uh, no matter what you do, it might have in unintended consequences, environmental uh, impacts and stuff. Comparative field studies for us in the U.S. is challenging because we don't have these large, we think we have big expensive patches, but it's really hard to find sites where you can divvy them up and do replicated studies of very many treatments. Um, so that's a challenge, but we wanted to figure out a way to look at the herbicides that are available and see if we happen to be missing something. And in the background, some of the work on, on uh, not we uh, Army Corps of Engineers with Nan Blomsky had done some very interesting work looking at the MASMOX and plum plumioxazine. The thing that she was doing was doing potted studies, which allowed her to do a lot more screens of activities. And the flip side is she did fairly young plants and wasn't quite sure if they were perineated. Andy Holting and uh, uh, co-workers in Oregon State did some work looking at amino pyrrolid, which is the newest of the picolinic acid group uh, following in the tracks of things like Milestone. And they had some very good work on that. Mark Renz has done excellent work in Wisconsin. And uh, he has quite a bit of work looking at cutting schedules and some of the chemistry applications, but not a big screen. The slide seems to have gone missing, but uh, Dan Jones, who was on the, the webinar with, from England, has done one of the best big studies. He has literally a football field size patch of knotweed, and they did some pretty exhaustive screens. There are some chemistries that aren't available to use in England and vice versa for things they use that we can't use here. Uh, but that's one really good work and he will be in the kind of recorded things that uh, Joe is gonna get on online for us. So 
basically we, we wanted to look at greenhouse studies because if you look at a lot of chemistries and we ended up, I'll just get to this slide here to show you in a nutshell, you don't have to absorb all this, but we basically screened, screened herbicides kind of bracketing certain mode of action groups. And the things that you people have seen a lot of would be the milestone, the, the growth regulator group, but milestone. And uh, down here, uh, which is habitat or arsenal, the amaz up here. But we looked at some other chemistries. Uh, Leanne Glomsky had looked at PPO inhibitors, uh, flumioxazine and carfentrazone. This one, carfentrazone, we actually got a label in wild rice, uh, cultivated wild rice patties to control giant burr reed, which is an aggressive perennial and which is not the way it's used in agricultural crop systems. But uh, with that kind of background, we thought it might have some potential. And this is an old time chemistry. Tebby fire on spike is an old chemistry, but it's a soil uptake product that generally works very well on brush and saplings. Um, we'll just move on. So basically we set up potted studies. We, we use bohemian uh, knotweed as the species all from a clone from the same site. We grew them out to three months of age to get them to a, where we knew they were perineated and had the crown buds. If you dug them out of the pots, they definitely have crown buds and some laterals starting. Uh, we sprayed them with a hand sprayer uh, for all the various treatments. And then at five weeks after, six weeks in this study, six weeks after treatment, we took biomass harvest, uh, which is the initial kill. Uh, but the thought being to try to stress these out. So, cause you want to kill the root system. So we could, we could just sit there and watch them slowly die forever. But we tried to speed it up by taking this earlier biomass. And this year it got late enough. They had to move them into the greenhouse for frost control. But then at 12 months, we took a second biomass. And then you look at various data things out of that. And here's basically what we saw. And the thing is to look at the boxes, I guess these are lined up in order of the uh, types of modes of action. And the things that we are used to seeing, the habitat of mazapir uh, at a rate titration, um, also rate titrations, this product works slowly <laughs> in case you guys have used it, you know, it's kind of slow. And uh, it's an excellent product for Phragmites, by the way, with their soil uptake, the thing it has is persistence and soil uptake. So if it hits the site that you're in, it has a track record of doing long-term control. The other one, sorry, that's a spam. Um, Tricopir, uh, Garlon was a bit surprising because I we did work in the late 80s before a biocontrol releases for loose strife and Garlon the, has labels for aquatic use. So we put the rates that it took for control of loose strife in the study and it just hammered it. It, it went out very fast. Life was, um, the others that look good, the solid boxes, they were clearly dead. The checkered boxes, you don't know. So the clearly dead, the high rate of milestone, this is the 14 ounce per acre rate, and this is two pounds or two quarts of the old Tordon product, which has issues in water systems, but absent use in water areas, it can be used in Minnesota. A bit of a surprise was how quick and how lethal Tebuthyron was. This is a totally soil uptake kind of product. So you spread granules out on the patch and it's, uh, it took it out at all the rates we tested. The, well, we'll get into what the pursuits, uh, the, excuse me, the mazapir habitat, uh, they, they just have a bunch of buds at the end of the regrowth studies and you're not sure if they're really gonna die or not. Aminopyrrolid, which is the new method, is the latest in this group of picolinic acid groups right here, like Toradon and Milestone and Stinger. Uh, it just, and the reps told us this that with bear, it's a bear product now originated in DuPont, but it, uh, it just doesn't do that. Kind of control you need on on knotweed, so we learned that. Here we go, and this just shows you just the general trends. This is the regrowth biomass, and that's control, and that's just to show you that the control. It took visual control ratings, which work well for us in weed science. They don't work well for publications because it's hard to replicate somebody's visual control. Biomass actually look very similar to the actual control ratings. That's all I want to make a point of there. 
in this case, pictures do tell the story very well, just tell a thousand words. So I'll go through a series of pictures showing the groups. And on the top, you'll see just before the first biomass uh, harvest at six weeks, what the plants looked like. And at the bottom, the plants just before we did the 12 week biomass harvest. So the bottom one will show you the regrowth where you stress them out by taking off that photosynthetic material that was surviving. And the top shows you what they looked like five, uh, six weeks after the initial treatment. And this is, so dicamba is a product that's known in the ag world. It's what you use for polygonaceae, which this is. And uh, so we wanted to look at dicamba uh, and uh, dicamba with this oxins, uh, in, um, it's an oxinic compound that actually zips up dicamba that they sell as a product called distinct. But if you look at the bottom, that's what they looked like on top uh, before biomass, the first, and after, just before the second biomass, on the bottom, you can see they all regrew quite well, so it just didn't do the trick. Actually, the adding a little 2,4-D in the dicamba made it a more respectable kind of suppression, whereas dicamba alone just, and one pound's a lot of dicamba, so it's just an answer to that question. Of the picolinic acid group, which is milestone, uh, chlorpyrrolid that you might maybe used to use for Canada thistle control in prairies, for example, is transline. That product just, at, at look at the bottom, it just didn't control it. Uh, method, <clears throat> this is a very high rate of method, would take out a lot of brush and uh, uh, dicots, and it also wasn't showing control. Fluoroxapyr, which is star rain, actually gave surprisingly good suppression. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so that's one of the picolinic acid groups that we haven't seen uh, people looking at, but it, it gave pretty good control of most reps, actually. But clearly, this is the group of picolinic acid herbicides that just nailed it, and they're quick, and uh, within a few weeks after treatment, you can see that they're going to be dead. And so looking at the bottom, there is no regrowth on any of these that toured on the uh, garlon in the middle or the, the uh, milestone on your right. Um, glyphosate, so glyphosate, there's issues now with the legal things going on with glyphosate. And so some people are less likely to use it. The, the non-crop market is gonna be pulled by Bayer. Um, but regardless, it does, it has a lot of uses because it is actually relatively non-toxic. But the challenge with the glyphosate is it takes out all the grasses and other herbaceous plants. It will stress them out, but it also doesn't tend to kill uh, completely. You always get this kind of regrowth where you're sitting there trying to figure out what it's going to do. Uh, there was some early work in the 80s when we were looking at another perennial polygamacy uh, in southern U.S. where 2,4-D which doesn't make sense if you know herbicide chemistry, 2,4-D gave uh, a synergistic act boost in the glyphosate control of polygonacy. That's why that was in this study. It definitely didn't in this study. This is the 2,4-D addition on the side there. Of all the other herbicides, this is the uh, imidazolinone group of which arsenal in habitat is a member. So this is uh, arsenal in the middle habitat at one pound. So when these were screened, the mazapir is the one that had the broadest activity. American cyanamide developed these. Uh, and it, at higher rates, took out everything. It's what is used along railroads for tree control and everything else, but it's slow. But there is these other products, uh, imazepapir, mazamox, and mazapec are all getting labels for these kind of habitats. And at all the rate titrations, they just didn't do it. On the left there, you see the regrowth with those. And this is just looking at a PPO that the same manufacturer has that they thought might give you better activity. It did zip up the activity, but it still didn't overcome uh, the lower rate use of amazapir. So amazapir, you see these buds, it's not as bad as glyphosate, but we watch those for up to six months after you treat them and uh, they just don't die, but they don't live either. And eventually some molds and things start to take them out. And this is the PPO things that uh, Glomsky had looked at in the Army Corps work. And uh, for us, they just didn't, they gave quite a bit of activity early on. This is the one that worked well in brewery and wild rice. Uh, it just didn't do it on this particular species. 
but a dead ringer, no pun intended, was a spike tebuthyron with the soil applications. <clears throat> At the lowest rate we tested it, they were clearly dead and clearly dead fast. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, glyphosate just leaves you lingering. You don't know if it's going to die or not. Miles, the newest picolinic acids, Milestone worked well. The method isn't the product for this kind of market. Tricopyr, which has been used for, you know, buckthorn and for loose tripe and various other things, and spike look really good. Uh, Toradon is a debatable thing. It is legal to use in Minnesota, but you just have to be aware of the environment that you're using it in. And uh, we just confirmed that of the imidazinones, the imazapir, uh, all the other products um, like imazapir, the analogs don't give you the activity you need. So it's still using that product as the main product of choice. We have a leg here, there we go. But unquestionably the, that top group is the ones if you want fast control and probably the most likely to be able to give you very few follow-up treatments needed. That would be those that toured on uh, Garlon, a Milestone, and Spike. Uh, the other is the Amazapir probably will do it if you just give it time with the root uptake. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Dallas Drazen and she can give you a little update on her work on genetics. And then I'll follow up with a little bit of what that genetic stuff that we're finding in Minnesota means as far as herbicide control. So stop sharing. Okay, I shared my screen, but I'm not 100% sure you're seeing the correct thing. Oops. We are, it looks good. We are. Yep. Oh, it does? Okay, my screen looks weird, so good, as long as y'all see the right thing. Okay, so like Roger said, I my name is Dallas. I'm on the same research team that he's on, except for instead of looking at herbicides, I have been tasked with looking at the genetics of knotweed in Minnesota. So to jump right in, we took samples from populations of knotweed all across Minnesota, you can see in the map on the right, and we collected from populations of Bohemian and Japanese and Giant and Compacta. And in addition to that, we also had collaborators send us either leaf tissue or DNA from Western North America, Belgium, Poland, and Japan. And we wanted that so that we could put the genetics of Minnesota knotweed into the context of knotweed that exists in other locations in the Adventive range. And when it was all said and done, when the DNA had been extracted and sequenced and multiple steps of quality control had been done, we ended up with 1,250 samples that we actually had genetic data from that we analyzed. And when we analyzed that data, we looked at it in a couple different ways. We would look at the complete data set, which involved the Minnesota samples combined with the collaborator samples. We would look at just Minnesota only samples. And then we would also drill down into looking at each taxon specifically. So one of the primary analyses that we did is something called a principal coordinates analysis or PCOA. And what that allows us to do is just see the samples in a 2D space, and that can tell us something about the genetic structure of those samples. And so what we're seeing here on this PCOA is that the samples are grouping by species. And so we have the giant on the lower part of the graph in blue, we have two groupings of Bohemian. We have this lower one right here, and then we have a little bit of a messier cluster in the upper right portion of the graph. And then for Japanese, that's also located in two parts of the graph. We have a small tight cluster here next to the Bohemian. And then we also have Japanese samples that spread across the x-axis, and we believe those to be compacta or compacta-like. And this is just a zoom in into what this upper right hand section looks like. Again, this cluster right here is the Japanese and then everything I'm cursing over right now is actually Bohemian. So you can see that they are very close to one another. This is the PCOA for the Minnesota only data set. You can see that it is similar to the complete data set and that we have samples grouping by species. We have a cluster of giants in the upper left 
we have again that cluster of Japanese and the Japanese that are dispersed across the x-axis. And then we also have the Bohemians grouping together. And within those, we see that there are three different clusters. And so the main takeaway from this PCOA for Minnesota only is basically that we see Japanese knotweed in Minnesota is not monotypic. And that's significant because that's a different finding from what other researchers have seen in other parts of the Adventist range where knotweed is a single male sterile clone. Another analysis we did is a phylogenetic splits network. You can think of it as a phylogenetic tree. And this had really good agreement with our PCOA and that we're seeing branching patterns that are the tree is branching by species. So this green circle is where the giant knotweed populations are located. The red circle, this branch is for Japanese knotweed. These four blue circles are where the Bohemian populations are located. And then this yellow circle is all of the compacta samples. So we combined the information from the PCOA with what we were seeing in the phylogenetic tree. And from that, we were able to make genetic identifications. And we found some samples that had been incorrectly morphologically identified. So from our data set, there were 59 Bohemian samples that were originally misidentified as Japanese. There were 12 Japanese samples that had been misidentified as Bohemian. And then there were 13 samples that were originally unknowns. We couldn't make a call of what species they were. And so we were able to get a genetic identification for those as well. So in the end, about 29% of our samples actually had morphological IDs that were incorrect. And this isn't a surprising finding in that there have been multiple other studies, other places in the United States where they have found that morphological IDs do not have good agreement with genetic IDs. And one of the most recent papers that talked about that and the, one of the most closest to home papers was a study in 2021 by Tipperary et al. in Wisconsin, where they also found that there wasn't good agreement between morphological and genetic identifications. Another study we did was called an analysis of molecular variants, and that just helped us see how the genetic variants within knotweed broke down into being distributed within and among populations. So you can see for the complete data set, there's 55% of molecular variation within populations, and then 45% was found between. And there were similar numbers in the Minnesota data set. It was 57% versus 43%. And for both complete and Minnesota, there was more variation within populations than between. And when we did the taxon only analyses, we saw that actually Bohemian was different in that the among population variation was higher than within for both the complete and Minnesota data sets. But for Japanese and giant, they were also similar to the complete and the Minnesota only data sets. And why this analysis is significant is that higher within than among population variation is something that we would expect from outcrossing species, species that are spreading sexually. And so it points towards potential sexual spread here in Minnesota. The final analysis I'm gonna talk about is that we looked at multi-locus genotypes of knotweed here in Minnesota and we use this to try to quantify the clonality of knotweed in Minnesota. So if you think of a clone, if you have two samples of the same clone, you're gonna be expecting those to be a 100% match across all loci in the genome. So all the A's, T's and G's and C's are matching one another. However, that's not always the case because sequencing error exists, somatic mutations exist. And so how we measured this error is that we used biological replicates. So we had one leaf, we would take two samples from that leaf, they would have DNA extracted separately, and then they would be sequenced separately. And of course, we'd expect those to come back as 100% match, but they wouldn't. And so then we'd be able to see what error had occurred just from sequencing. 
And once we had that, we were able to run this analysis. And depending on the various metrics that we put into the program, we see that there is 118 to 156 multi-locus multi genotypes of knotweed here in Minnesota from the 246 populations we sampled. And that's significant because less multi-locus genotypes than populations signifies a predominance of clonal spread for knotweed here in Minnesota. But when we looked into the data set, we did see that there was evidence for 22 populations that were spreading sexually, and then also 18 further populations that had evidence of spreading sexually and asexually. So here's my key findings. The first one being that Bohemian, we did see to be the most prevalent taxon here in Minnesota. And again, this is similar to what the Tipperary et al. paper found as well. They found Bohemian to be the most predominant taxon in Wisconsin. So we're seeing that same thing here based on our data set. We also saw that sexual spread does exist, but asexual spread still seems to be the dominant mechanism of spread for knotweed in Minnesota. Again, Japanese is not monotypic. We're not seeing that it's that single male sterile clone. We saw morphological IDs are not a 100% match with genetic IDs. And that also the distribution of molecular variation for knotweed here in Minnesota is similar to the distribution that you see in other parts of the world that we measured. So a quick thank you, of course, to everyone on the team and our funders, and I will turn it back over to Roger. Okay, thanks, Dallas. Um, share this. Hello. <laughs> Here we go. So with Dallas's information, I guess that we're up against a bigger battle, in my opinion, because of there's a lot of, of seed spread going on, in addition to what traditionally we thought of as clonal spread with vegetative fragments and stuff. And Bohemian is a hybrid of the giant and the Japonica. So we have a lot of Bohemian. It's just evidence of a lot of asexual and sexual spread. So it's going to progress a lot more rapidly, possibly, than we would hope. One of the questions that brings up, do these differ in their herbicidal response? And a way to look at that is, do these titrations, this is just a, a schematic of what you think about. You do a increasing dose rate and some kind of response and you see the slope. If you did a high rate, like we're controlling and you kill everything, but you don't really do much to anything, you don't know anything. So we had to find this little sweet spot. Took a while, but we found the sweet spot. And then you start, in our case, we'd do this type of thing, looking at the uh, three, the hybrid Bohemia, the Japonica and the uh, Giant and see if they differ. So it took us a long time to find the sweet spot, but we did, and we're not they were advancing. We did the same thing I just talked about in the general study with doing a beheading to accelerate the stress on the plants and then follow them later on. And early on the visual control ratings, this is a visual control of how bad did they look. Uh, uh, we followed it over time. And, um, but that's hard to publish again, but it was clear, it's clear from the very beginning with something like milestone that giant is a lot more susceptible to giant in green. And the uh, bohemian, which is a hybrid of the red line and the green line, the hybrid of Japonica and the uh, giant was in the in between and um, the Japanese was going to be the hardest one to kill uh, based on visual. With habitat, it's a little messier, it's not as clear, but you do see the same kind of trends with the trend for the giant being more susceptible. Visually, it clearly is more susceptible if you look at all parameters, just looking at them. The Japonica and the uh, Bohemia don't separate out quite as quickly, so they might be a lot more similar in their response to the habitat. Uh, biomass, uh, for this, I think I got this next slide for the sake of time. Biomass after we beheaded them, and really stressed them out. You, so that's why the lines differ at the start point, they've been beheaded. So your this is growth from zero. So that's why we're starting at different points at uh, 12 weeks, but that clearly shows for milestone that the um, giant is much, much more susceptible. Uh, it's a big plant, but it's more susceptible to the herbicides uh, from what we're seeing. And uh, the Japonica and the 
hybrid, the bohemian, might not differ that much, but a little trend for the bohemian to be a little more susceptible. With the mazapir, again, uh, the giant, very susceptible, and it's not that clear that the hybrid and japonica will differ that much. And we're not certain of the genetics. These two might be a lot closer than we think based on the, the closeness of, in some of Dallas's work of the uh, uh, bohemian to a lot of the Japanese population in their genetic uh, structure. Uh, that just shows the visual on the, on the left. The mild, this is just two weeks after treatment with a milestone, and that's the giant on the left, bohemian in the middle, and the japonica up to the right. And it's, it's clear that uh, giant is a lot more susceptible. So that gives us a little information as we get into populations that we need to manage and what we need to think about. And just thank our sponsors as well. Uh, the MITPIC, Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plant Pest Center, is one of our key funders on our work. I'll turn it back to you, Joe. Sure, thank you so much, Roger and Dallas. That was really great stuff. Um, really glad you were able to have a place on this thing to share all that research. That was really great. Uh, before we move on, uh, I think I'm gonna touch just a little bit on some non-chemical treatment methods, mainly smothering, which is something that Justin Townsend and I um, have been working with uh, last couple of years. Justin is the Ramsey County CWMA manager. If you have any, uh, if you're a resident or you have any knotweed or anything like that, any invasives, he's a great guy to talk to. Uh, maybe he'll put his email in the chat for anyone to uh, contact him. But I'm just going to get right into it. Uh, what we found to use for some other material was this black geo textile fabric. Uh, it's very strong and very thick, so it's pretty effective, um, very time resistant, weather resistant, and not weed can't grow up and through it. So after you obtain something similar to that, at least, um, you might want to start thinking about smothering. What we found to be the most effective is when these knotweed patches are in certain, they're the scope is you know, a certain scale. So if these are smaller patches, then they can be dense, but as long as they aren't um, you know, scattered plants, uh, smothering can be pretty effective. So this is why we tested a lot of this stuff out with landowners in their backyards just due to the fact that there's plenty of barriers in a sense already in place so you know fences and property lines and you know there's sometimes there'll be you know pathways of concrete things like that so it, it's much more manageable to smother knotweed in those uh, scenarios there were some parks that have knotweed that we'll visit and follow up on but because those plants are so scattered and not in a cluster, it's harder to smother. But as far as the process goes, it sort of depends on how big the infestation is. If you know these plants are six, eight, or 10 feet tall or something like that, you might have to cut them down before you can smother. And if you do choose to do that, you have to be pretty careful. You don't wanna you know, throw any plant materials away from the infestation area keep everything you know within where you're going to smother and but once that area is ready to be smothered you're going to then you know measure out your cover material and it's important to have uh, more area of cover material than the actual infestation site and this is just because you know the knotweed is going to try and grow out from around the sides and the perimeter so giving yourself more room is going to ensure that the infestation is contained a lot better. So after you've laid down your smother material over the infestation site, I mean, really the last thing to do is just to stabilize it. Um, what I used most often was just, you know, sod stakes and landscaping um, staples. You just hammer that through the perimeter or the corners of the landscaping fabric or geotextile fabric. And you can put things in the center to help stabilize too, if you wish, but the perimeter is definitely the most important. 
and we learned a lot and we're still learning a lot about this stuff too. Um, one thing that I definitely got a really good taste of is that it, it, it does increase uh, labor costs. There were um, plenty of sites that I went and visited this past summer to smother knotweed. I actually have a couple of photos that I was gonna share. So I'll put those up right now. So this was actually the very first um, Japanese knotweed infestation I ever smothered. Uh, so this was back in early June. Um, it was alongside a bike trail. And so I went in there with the loppers, I cut them down, kept everything in that little patch of grass right there. And then this was the result with that black geotextile fabric. You're able to keep everything there and smother it and stabilize it. So the whole time it took though to complete that process was around an hour to an hour and a half, which is you know much longer than it would take to treat a site like that with herbicide. Um, so if you're thinking about that from a land manager perspective, that's definitely something to be aware of. And one other thing we learned was that smothering, while it does limit the growth of the knotweed and kind of like the range of new growth and new infestation. Uh, smothering all on its own doesn't do any lasting damage to the rhizomes of the plants. So if you do choose to use this method, uh, it's important to couple it with herbicide to see any kind of real effect or anything close to eradication. I, there's no silver bullet for Japanese knotweed, um, but herbicide is definitely something that has a has its role cemented in the management of it. And lastly, I would just you know touch on, I mean, there's in plenty of environmental impacts that go into the creation of all these management tools. And so that includes you know the black geotextile fabric that I mentioned. Uh, what we like so much about it, obviously, is just how long it lasts and how durable it is, which is great. So it reduces costs, uh, you know, of having to buy more or replace old ones that have been used. But that's something to think about when we consider all these management methods and tools. And it's actually something that uh, will lead into this next segment. We have some really great uh, clips of people that we spoke with from the United Kingdom. And I'm actually gonna hand it off to Justin Townsend, who's going to introduce these people and who they are, what they've done. And uh, so Justin, go ahead. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, um, Joe had an excellent idea of reaching out to some folks that have a whole lot more experience than we do in this. And the United Kingdom has been dealing with it for many, many years. And uh, to the point where you'll hear Gethin talk about it in there, it's difficult to sell a house in the United Kingdom if it has not weed. It's, uh, they're, they're so far progressed in, in, in what they're dealing with. Um, so I am going to try to make up some time here to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, you're going to hear Sophie Hawking talk first uh, about alternative methods, um, why not to maybe use smothering, uh, and some other things. So we're going to get started with her, uh, and then we're going to go on to Dan, which Roger mentioned uh, before. I am going to throw all their bios in the chat if you want to see that and I'm also going to throw some papers in there while they're talking again try to save some time here and hopefully in the end uh, this will prompt some conversation and you know apologies in advance this is something new for us but I thought you'd all be really interested to see uh, what people are doing across the world in terms of, of not weed management so I'll give this a go and trying to share my screen and specifically the media player. And I do believe I need to share sound as well. Joe, if you want to give me a thumbs up if you hear sound. Yeah, this feels like a good time for me to jump on actually. Um, as I mentioned earlier, part of my research during my PhD was to kind of assess the impacts um, of different treatment methods for Japanese knotweed. Um, and 
me and Dan Jones actually conducted the life cycle assessment to try and compare the different impacts of all these different um, treatments. And yeah, I think it was one of those kind of breakthrough moments in my PhD, definitely, just because it does start to you know, get you thinking of how we really need to start considering the costs and the, benef the benefits of knotweed management and how does that tie in with the efficacy of all these different management methods. Um, so, you know, as Dan's kind of alluded to, not all management methods are equal, but both in terms of how effective they are at actually managing Japanese knotweed, but also their wider impacts as well. And I don't know about you guys, but definitely in the UK, especially with, you know, increasing concern around the climate um, emergency and things like that, we do get to have some negative, um, maybe public perceptions of different treatment methods for Japanese knotweed and herbicides in general on a wider scale. Um, but I think what we need to do is kind of tackle this in an objective way and have some objective thinking around what goals we want to achieve in invasive plant management. And why does knotweed management fit into this wider climate emergency? Um, yeah, this feels like a good time for me to jump on actually. Um, All right, there we are. There's Sophie. So, um, like as you can hear in there, she's talking a, uh, a lot about, you know, the side effects and efficacy of some of that, which Dan will get into here. And apologies for losing the video there for a minute. Um, I am going to jump ahead a little bit to Dan. Let's see. at thing is that you can get away with application to the knotweed plants up until they've got about 50 percent of the green leaves on the on the plant um, as long as there's enough pump because i would imagine yeah the the way that the glyphosate's working in these rhizome forming plants is that the leaves and stems are effectively pumped which is pushing that glyphosate down into the apical meristems. So yeah, that's that's kind of your, your optimal um, point of application. Um, and yeah, you know, while, while you've got that um, big above ground growth and you've got that push down into the, into the rhizome system, that's where you, you kind of maximize your translocation. But I mean, what I'm kind of getting at is in terms of what you'd be dealing within the sort of the Northwest or not the Northwest, the, the Midwest is that you've got this um you've got a much more restricted stage four basically i would i would imagine it's going to get colder for you quicker isn't it you it's going to flower and then go into rapid senescence i'd imagine i i i i wouldn't pretend to be an expert i've only been to minnesota once <laughs> and uh yeah i that was during the summer but i would imagine you you get colder winters than we do we're we're an oceanic climate aren't we we've got the gulf stream and that so we get mild wet winters um and increasingly mild as well obviously with ch climate change so did that Thank answer the question <laughs> um, so the yeah. flowering is around in august is that when it starts to you see full bloom in in your areas yeah i think J july august yeah okay that, that sort of time yeah, it, 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 the onset becomes apparent in, in July, but August and yeah. September, you'd expect to see it in sort of fairly full flower. But it, but it's, again, depending on what sort of season we're having, you know, you can still see, you know, you'll still find plants, you know, at, at the top end of our uh, sort of altitude range in the, the areas that we're working in, still flowering into November. Mm hmm. Mm. So... Uh, Dan, well, the things you're describing for the source sink kind of things, there one thing that people talk about is it's just such a huge plant, depending on what kind of equipment you have, it's hard to get it sprayed. So the, you'll do, there some, Mark Renz, a colleague in Wisconsin, neighboring state, did some work on clipping. They would cut it simply to get to manage that, that growth so they could get a better spray application in the fall. Uh, so you're, you're kind of resetting that source sink and slowly driving it down. But do you see any things that kind of, that are cutting tight into this simply from being able to manage the size of that plant and well, the things you're describing? Well, I, I, I absolutely agree with how they're feeling about it because 
yeah, when you, it's quite intimidating. Like you, you've got your spray license, you think, right, okay, so I'm going to start spraying five hectares of knotweed. And then you sort of actually get there on the day and you've got a 20 litre knapsack sprayer. And, and you're thinking, well, where do you even begin with this? And uh, you know, that, that it is, and it's, it's a real thing. I mean, it's, 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 it's huge. So in, there's, there's sort of a number of elements to this. So um, in terms of cutting, because, because the above ground parts of the plant are, are so they're essential in order to, to, to move the photosimilate and the glyphosate down into the rhizome, if you cut them, you significantly reduce the efficacy of the glyphosate. Um, however, you know, getting, I mean, we, you've got to knock paths through it, haven't you? I mean, you, yeah. you've got to have access to the knotweed, but what, what we use is um, a sand, well, a standard knapsack sprayer with a two meter long lance attachment. And I think the kind of key thing that I began to understand as you spray the knotweed is, you don't have to spray the whole thing to the point of runoff. You, you're only spraying a small, a handful of the leaves on each stem. So I think off the top of my head, it's about 200 leaves per knotweed plant in full maturity. It's that sort of number. So you don't need to spray it onto all of those leaves. You need to get maybe 10, 15 of them with a decent splash across them, you know, almost to the point of runoff. And the way, I'll, I'll, I'll provide some diagrams on like how I did it down at the site, but you just sort of break these larger blocks up with the paths and then you just make sure that you've got that reach over, that you've got the two metre reach and you can spray into the canopy, you've got the paths that you can move away from, so you, you sort of spray backwards through them. So it's, it's quite, like once you've got the logistics of it down, it's quite, it's quite a straightforward thing to do, isn't it? It's like, but you, you don't, initially think that that would be the way to do it i think it's really straightforward Dale. i think it, 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 it's, really, it's really obvious but that's because i've done thousands and thousands of hours of it now um, and it's it's one of those things isn't it where it just doesn't seem complicated at all now but but to my mind i i, I haven't got the resource to go in and cut stands prior to treatment um we're, we're on with you know we're, we've got other treatments for for giant hogweed and, and and other invasives and i just don't have the resource coupled to the fact that I think our best results were from when we trialed cutting and stuff I think our best results were from the plant being intact both pre and post treatment and, and like Dan says you know a little bit of site preparation when you arrive you know to cut some access routes through it and, and formulate a plan of how you're going to manage that site or how you're going to tackle that site and I think the big thing for us as well is the fact that we know we're going back in years two three maybe even four or five so you know you haven't you know, I think the, the emphasis on whilst I'd like to be really thorough and get good coverage, um, I'm not hung up on, like Dan said, treating every single leaf because I know I'm going back to do retreatments in, in year two, three and probably four or five really. All right, Joe, I think I'm going to leave it there. We've got one more segment that we can maybe play a little bit later. But uh, I wanted to get everybody's uh, questions in. And so if you want to throw those in the chat, uh, if we need some more explanation, I'll have you unmute. But um, looks like, am I seeing, did Lori step off? I believe everybody else is on except Lori still. So I'll monitor the chat. Throw anything out there. If you just want to unmute, you can uh, throw that in the chat too, and uh, we'll do our best to to get to everybody. And I, I will just mention again uh, that the full recording of that discussion that we had a couple weeks ago with uh, Dallas, or not, oh, Dallas and Roger were there too, um, but Sophie, Dan, and Griffin uh, will be available later. Um, it was a really good, really good time. And I talked about a lot. And if you have the time and the interest, I highly recommend checking that out.
In fact, there is also a question uh, from Monica. Monica asks, would it be an option to just spray lower leaves if not all leaves need to be sprayed? So I think what, I think you're referring to the thing that uh, Dr. Daniel Jones was talking about, about not having to spray every leaves, is that right? Yes, okay, so yeah, I think so. Um, that was definitely something that he said that really caught my attention. I know it caught Justin's attention too. Um, and we were actually just talking about this a little bit uh, right before this webinar that the uh, possibility, or one thing he maybe could have meant, cause I know he was, he's pretty big on glyphosate, which is, um, I mean, with the, what they have there and what's available, that certainly does seem like one of the better options that they have. Um, but for them, these sites are just so massive, especially the ones that you know Dan manages. The the uh, they still needed to knock down some of those plants and make sure that they can move through these infestations because they're you know quite they're nothing like what we have here which is kind of what sent me on that rabbit hole and checking out all that stuff and reaching out to them but uh roger did you have anything to add yeah just to comment on the spraying the lower part of the plant i mean just um in in the old days a lot of radio tracer la uh, lab studies were done and you where you pinpoint the tracer herbicide uh, it, you can tell where it goes. And if, if the plant is moving stuff down, the lower part of the plant in particular would be a good spot. And these are so massive, if it's a small patch uh, where you can get at the plant, but you don't want to be want, waving a wand all over, you know, and spraying around the neighborhood, <laughs> it would give you an opportunity to keep the spray drift a little bit lower and uh, probably still give good results, especially after flowering. Uh, when the thing is starting to move more, the more the sink is is the rhizome system rather than the upper parts of the plant. Did you want to touch on the smothering question, Joe? Did you see that one? Yep, I was just about to talk about that one. So, uh, Raining White asks, is there a best time for smothering? And how do you make sure the plant is completely dead before removing the smothering mat? So the best time to smother Japanese knotweed is gonna be around the end of May and early June. And the reason that is, is because that's gonna maximize the amount of time that the sun, like that great summer sun is gonna be beaten down on the smothering material over the Japanese knotweed and it's gonna just cook everything underneath there. Um, but unfortunately, like I mentioned before, uh, smothering is not going to effectively eradicate knotweed all on its own. So it doesn't do any lasting damage to the rhizomes or its root systems. So that's where herbicide comes into play and you'd want to do some herbicide follow-up treatments later in the year. So around uh, like the second half of August to the at least the first half of September, maybe towards October too, depending on the weather. And Carol, Carol asks if they're still using biocontrol in Great Britain. Um, I Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that they mentioned it in the topic or sorry excuse me in the discussion um but i can't recall what they said specifically or if we had a clip for that maybe yeah there's a few we didn't delve into it too deep um dan's top three uh control methods were were all chemical um they're just really not seeing anything with the bio controls or smothering or any non-chemical controls we just touched on it and the two hour conversation was mainly on how to best use those chemicals in a judicious way. So um, I've ran across some papers. I believe they're still using that biocontrol, but I don't think it's uh, 
um, in in heavy rotation anymore. So we also have. Oh, I might just chime in on the bio control Monica. If you're still on, you probably know more than I. But uh, there is a psyllid that's been released in the U.S., but it's just the initial releases at some select locations, and I haven't heard that it's actually established yet. And I think that was some of the challenges in UK was trying to get the the insect agent to actually establish um, and do something. So, <laughs> but a work in progress. So Matt has a has a question. Um, Matt assists some residents that actually have infestations that have grown into their houses or into their basements. In these situations, herbicide treatment seems like not something to do. What are some other methods to employ in these odd situations where the plant is intertwined with the dwelling? So I think that's actually really interesting that you have some residents that are that have that issue because that was um, one of like the first things that I noticed about um, the United Kingdom and people there are how big of an issue that has become with residents and their homes. Personally, I haven't gotten the chance to speak with any residents with that issue, um, but I would certainly recommend looking into the United Kingdom and their treatments. I know that they really, at least with who we spoke with, they really believe in herbicide and as ultimately the best treatment method. But as far as what to do when they are handling uh, like residents and things like that, um, we didn't get to explore that in our discussion. So I'm very sorry. But Can I add one thing I saw a while back at uh, uh, MESAC conference, I think it was the, or uh, yeah, the Midwest Invasive Species Conference. Um, in Belgium, they were using steam in some of these areas where they couldn't get to it. I don't know the efficacy of that and I'm not promoting it in any way, shape or form, but it's something to look into. There's some large companies out there using um, heavy polymer blankets and then steaming it underneath. Uh, in these areas next to houses and, and concrete and sidewalks where you can't get in. I would say, I think um, it'd be interesting to hear what Dan says, but I think he would say, um, it, you know, give the herbicide an, an opportunity to work. If you have plant material growing above ground and you can get it on there, back to that conversation of, you know, putting enough on there that you don't just torch the thing and and turn it brown right away before it has a chance to to act and get into the rhizomes but if you experiment around with keeping that thing alive enough to get the, get it to draw down and i would really recommend reading his paper on that get it to draw down into those rhizomes and see if you can kill it off over a few years um but I couldn't tell you what that looks like, unfortunately, um, but keep us updated. That's a tough one, a real tough one. Yeah, I'm glad we haven't run into any of that yet, but I know it's around the corner. I know it's out there. Before we switch topics to another question, uh, Matt asked about injection for treating uh, knotweed versus a foliar application, and he's wondering about the efficacy. Uh, Justin might have better answers for this. I haven't personally done any injection, but I would imagine it does not decrease the eff efficacy at least. Um, probably one of the main uh, downfalls of full, or excuse me, um, injection treatments is just, it's more labor intensive, but if you're just trying to take care of some stuff in your basement, maybe that is an option. I'd recommend Dan's in, in that full recording of, of the clips that I played will also be available on the YouTube. And like I said in the chat, if you want that recording or any others uh, or, or the recording for this, 
it'll be out on the Ramsey County YouTube page in the coming days as soon as we can get it processed and get it up. Um, and so give us some time. Uh, but if you want it, email me and we'll make sure that you, we ping you when it when it's posted. I would say again that read into and look at Dan's paper and the recording because I think his research suggests that um, their injection is not more efficacious and it could possibly be less because when you're cutting those stems, his, his, his reasoning was when you cut those stems, you're putting that energy into the rhizomes and that uh, the herbicide isn't necessarily getting down into the rhizomes to kill them all uh, as easily as it would with a foliar application. Um, so what we really landed on was that it's the foliar application and it's all about us learning the timing and us learning the environmental factors that affect how efficacious those applications are. Perfect. So, oh, go ahead, Roger. Just one other note um, on uh, those injections. It is actually a very high rate of the products that they're using just because it's um, it's a pinpoint application, but it's a high rate. <clears throat> and part of the, the the lack of better efficacy is that you you got to get the things into the simplast where the sugars and things are going in the plant and injecting into a stem is kind of a, not really getting it into the areas where that kind of transport inside that little river of sugars in a plant occurs. And it'd be a little bit similar on a rhizome, uh, trying to inject into a rhizome. You can get activity, but it's probably not the most effective use of the products. But if there's some reason that you have to be that localized, um, you can get activity out of those. I told one lady that was trying to control her patch over in South Minneapolis, because uh, uh, she was really, not liking this not weed, but if it made you feel better, but it's good therapy to do all the work. She was digging up the rhizomes and injecting them. So it was a lot of labor to get in there and, and get at them. Um, anyway, that's my thoughts. Perfect, thank you. Before it gets buried, did you see Michael's question? Yep, I was just about to answer that one. So Michael asks, if you smother Japanese knotweed in the late spring, what herbicide would you use in the late summer or in the fall? Let me follow up. And he says, I presume there would be nothing green. So I'll answer the second part first, actually. You'd actually be pretty surprised like of the resiliency of this knotweed, even when it's being smothered. Um, if you pull back those tarps, you can still find some new growth in there. Um, it's not going to be anything like uh, what it looked like before you smothered it, obviously, but, and also depending on how well you smothered, there, it, now we could potentially have started to grow out from around the perimeter as well. So there may be some green, uh, but as far as what herbicide to use, uh, what Justin and I used, uh, what we used personally that worked was milestone. That's what we used. Um, but if you are a landowner um, who's just trying to treat the knotweed on their own property, uh, it's milestone's a bit expensive and you get a lot more than you'll need. So you might want to look at some other options in terms of herbicide for that, um, possibly Roundup, but or any, any sort of glyphosate maybe. But if you use glyphosate, you have to be a bit careful with that because you don't want to torture a lot or anything like that. Okay. And just if I may, uh, just a thought on that. Uh, if you have rhizomes that are that stressed and they're trying to reestablish a beachhead, uh, you don't want to spray right away because it's, it's just going to get metabolized out or broken down in that upper 
nothing's going to be translocated down. It'd be the same as basically just breaking off the chute as far as disrupting that architecture that's being built. So give it, it's counterintuitive, but give it time to establish more, uh, get some height. Uh, otherwise, it's just not going to translocate that material down. And maybe this is a good question to segue into Carol's next question. How long do you extend the fabric beyond the edge of the patch? And I'd say where we use it, we're always running into another barrier, right? You know, a house, a foundation, a sidewalk, um, hopefully all three usually. Um, and, and then in that case, you know, we do get some coming up through anywhere where there's daylight. And those are kind of our sacrifice plants that we're hoping to get some through. We just don't want as many, I guess, um, is what we're hoping. But then again, you know, don't touch those, wait until fall, don't keep hacking it down, just wait until fall and then treat then. And I guess our kind of in the field experiment is, is that enough to get into um, you know, after talking with people, now I'm skeptical of my own <laughs> work, but, uh, you know, we'll see how it works in the real world. And just to give you a number, Carol, um, whenever I would do a smother job, I would, you know, try and shoot for maybe six to eight inches, um, depending on how serious the infestation was. Matt asks another question. Uh, what do you advise for best practices for getting rid of clippings? So I would say, I mean, if you can really help it to not cut at all, but if you're going to be smothering and you need to cut, um, you should definitely keep those clippings in that infestation area and put the smother material over the clipping air, all the clippings and over the infestation area. So it is also, it's 5.30. Um, I'm more than happy to keep the lights on and to keep this going if there's more questions. Uh, Justin and I will stick it out to the bitter end. Um, so if you have more questions, feel free. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, saw a lot of good names out there. Again, if you have specific questions um, about treatment and treatment on your site, we're happy to answer them. I know we, we've run into almost every kind of site now. Um, we can at least point you in the right direction. And like we've said more times than one today, we're learning too. So help us help you. More sites we have, the more we'll learn. And it looks like we missed Lori, so uh, don't get to say this to her. I'll have to follow up later. But Roger and Dallas, thank you very much again for coming on today and sharing what you have. It's, appreciate it very much. And thank you too for getting this organized and getting us in touch with the um, across the pond. <laughs> it's, it's very informing. I think it'll be setting up some good collaborations. Yeah, I really hope so. I hope we can do more like that in the future hopefully soon.